Okay, uh, welcome for the second uh, session of uh, today on documenting violence. We started with a slight delay already, so I will waste no time and start immediately by introducing our uh, esteemed panelists. Um, to my extreme left hand side is uh, Dr. Andre Mateka. I hope I pronounced this more or less correctly, more or less. Um, Dr. Mateka holds degrees in political sciences and history. He is currently the deputy director of the Czech Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes in Prague, where he is responsible for historical research and education. He has been a lecturer at Charles University Prague. He is also a founder and related expert of the Civic Education Center at the Masaryk University in the Czech Republic where he works around ideas and practices of citizenship education in the Czech uh, context. And he is basically a specialist in public history, reflections on historical discourses, citizenship, uh, citizenship education. Uh, next, uh, the next panelist is uh, Professor Irina Ramanava. Uh, she's a professor of history at the Department of History in the European Humanities University in Vilnius, Lithuania. Last year, she was also visiting professor at Sciences Po in uh, Paris. And her research interests are Soviet history, Stalinism, uh, the history of Belarusia, also oral history. Um, she has published extensively on the history of Belarusia, the mechanisms and impact of Stalinist repression and violence. And she is perhaps interest, interesting to note, currently preparing a book uh, on the Lepel case of 1937, which is a show trial in the Belarusian uh, uh, Soviet Socialist Republic in the so-called Lepel district. And it was one of the first cases, or the first case perhaps, of a regional show trial that has a large significance for explaining subsequent trials all around uh, the Soviet Union. And last but not least, uh, uh, Professor Anna Kaminski, the director of the Bundesstiftung zu Aufarbeitung uh, der SED Diktatur in Berlin. I, I uh, just read it of my paper. Um, so she has administrative responsibilities, but as a scholar, her current research interests include memory policy, uh, memory culture in former communist countries, and has also published extensively on, um, amongst others, everyday life in communist Germany. Has been involved in many research projects, uh, amongst others projects about xenophobia in East Germany, the influence of communist education models in the former communist German De uh, Democratic Republic, and Soviet special camps in East uh, Germany. So we have a very uh, esteemed uh, panel, I think. Thank you all for uh, joining me uh, in this uh, important session on uh, documenting violence. Um, it will be a bit slightly different than the format we followed in the previous session. What we will do is I will first give you a uh, brief, I hope, uh, introduction of uh, the subject, 10, maximum 15 minutes, try to limit it to 10 minutes. Then I will give each of you the floor for an individual um, case or a country uh, statement. Uh, and perhaps also a reaction to some of the points I raised. It's, it's up to you. And then I would uh, immediately like to go to the, uh, the audience for the plenary uh, discussion for uh, questions and answers to, uh, to our panel. Uh, so to these three people, not to me, but to these three uh, people. So that's more or less the schedule of, uh, of uh, this session on documenting violence. Uh, it needs, I think, a bit of an introduction because it is uh, potentially a, a huge, very large um, uh, topic, um, and I would argue that it even forms uh, perhaps the basis or a foundation or a starting point for most of the other uh, themes and topics discussed during the other sessions of this conference. I'm sure that most of the uh, chairs of the sessions will say that their session is the most important. I also have some arguments to defend that this is a very, very important session. Without proper uh, documentation of, of mass violence, the toolbox of transitional justice becomes very difficult to implement, eh? reparation, accountability measures. Without a proper policy of documenting uh, mass violence, uh, the subsequent work of historians, but also of expert commissions, truth commissions, etc., becomes very difficult. Proper memory work becomes difficult without proper documentation but also education, for example, uh, to refer to the previous session. 
And ultimately, the issue of democratic transparency in each and any society uh, has to have this foundation. Uh, free access to information starts with uh, a proper foundation of, of, of documentation of mass uh, violence. So in short, it is, one could say, a foundation, a basis, a precondition, a necessary precondition for many of the series of initiatives that the international community, national states, uh, grassroots communities, local communities have to take in order to deal with uh, massive uh, past violations of human rights. So it is a broad topic. It is broad in another sense as well. Um, when we talk about documenting violence, perhaps our first spontaneous thought will immediately go to archival policies of states. That's probably what you all spontaneously think about uh, when you see the title of this session. Preserving and um, disclosing uh, archives, creating the proper legislation, institutional capacity, the funding for collecting, safeguarding, perhaps digitizing, uh, and basically disclosing essential archives, military archives, uh, secret police files, uh, uh, police, the files of the secret police, of justice departments, etc. That's the first uh, major component of the session. But it is potentially much larger than this. Violence is heterogeneous, and so is uh, documenting violence. I will just offer two concrete examples. Oral history is important. It's often overlooked by, institution, by official institutions, but systematically gathering uh, testimonies by eyewitnesses, by victims, also by perpetrators, through programs of oral history can be of vital interest for uh, many initiatives that will follow perhaps decades later. That's the first component. And the second component that I want to uh, add is um, the physical forensic documentation of violence, particularly relevant, obviously, in context where there are cases of mass disappearances. Um, such physical documenting activities concern the uncovering, for example, of mass graves, the forensics of identification, which again forms a precondition for many accountability measures, rights of reburial, reuniting victims with their families, etc. So, so the forensics of, of identification, uh, Spain is, is a well-known example in Europe, obviously the mass graves of the Franco era. So these all form components of this huge topic uh, of documenting violence. So I hope uh, I've already made my point that it's, it's huge. It, and it's also absolutely crucial. Uh, it's, no need, it's no coincidence that the need to properly document violence in its broadest sense, has also found its way in international and national legislation in various forms. And just one interesting strand of international legislation that I would like to quickly bring to the fore is the so-called right to truth, uh, recognized by the UN now as a basic human right. The right to truth was already embryonically present in the Geneva Conventions of 1949, a particular protocol that recognized uh, the rights of families to know the fate of their relatives. Um, but it was much later pioneered, amongst others, in an inter-American court for human rights in a case on a forced disappearance. So it's, it's a right uh, that implies that states have an obligation to inform relatives of those missing persons about their fate. And it was elaborated in a series of UN resolutions and decisions uh, where it was interpreted much more broadly. And as UN Special Rapporteur uh, Louis Joannet said in 1997, the right to truth is a collective right, collective right, drawing upon history to prevent violations from recurring in the future. It is corollary to a, a, it is, uh, corollary is sorry, a duty to remember which states a state must assume. And then a very important sentence, the knowledge of the oppression it has lived through is part of a people's national heritage and as such must be preserved. It's very interesting, the combination of these two words, uh, human rights and a national heritage. Uh, the knowledge of an oppression becomes a national heritage, very um, important, I think. Um, so this, this legislation has given rise to the idea that states today have a so-called archival uh, imperative regarding the dark pages of their uh, history. So 
I think I made clear that documenting violence is not about passively putting a lot of paper documents in some building, but that it's uh, an active and very essential policy that it involves many strategic uh, choices um, that are always related to political, uh, political decisions, but also the politics of, of, of history and memory. Huh? I will throw six points at you for discussion, at you first and foremost, but also at you. These are six points that uh, are very general and, and very large. We don't have to take up all of them. Uh, it's, it's up to you to, to, to use some of them as you see fit. Um, they are just general ideas for, for, for discussion. First of all, um, and they're also kind of different. I mean, I will jump from one point to the next, so they're on, on very different uh, levels, but they seem to me important for this uh, session. The first point is, uh, has to do with the judicial basis for uh, archives. Um, I think that many crucial archival collections about mass violence or mass violations of human rights are created through judicial structures. Um, state-sponsored measures for accountability, trials, courtrooms, expert commissions, semi-judicial um, structures. So this way, I think we have to recognize that much of the crucial archival source material has a judicial logic, a judicial nature. Uh, so this is the first general remark that I want to make, a question that relates to this potential particular impact, positive or negative, that a judicial basis of the source material has for subsequent historical research. I just throw it at, uh, at you, this idea. The second uh, issue has to do with uh, sequencing um, in the protection of archives and collection. Uh, when we, I think we have to recognize that in many post-conflict societies and, and contexts that uh, collecting documents, collecting testimonies, collecting evidence is hardly ever a real priority in the immediate aftermath of a violent conflict or a dictatorial regime. Such uh, post-conflict societies have many other acute priorities to deal with, and they often have a weak institutional capacity uh, to, for example, demand that the military or the police or whatever state institution hand over their archives, so to speak. So, that is, I think, a structural uh, uh, problem, that fact-finding, archival prospection is only fully launched decades sometimes after the period in question. So this obviously means that archives can have been lost, damaged, and certainly for oral history, for example, it means that decades of, of changing uh, collective memory has already uh, taken place. So. This is a potential topic for discussion. Also, the European uh, Union, for example, could perhaps play a larger role here because it has the technical knowledge and the technical expertise for supporting efforts to safeguard collections in certain post-conflict societies until these societies are perhaps ready to actually begin certain traje tra trajectories of dealing with their past. And it might also have a stronger power to demand in stronger ways from certain states that they enact their so-called archival imperative. A third key issue um, are specific collections, for example, secret police files. Is it, good, is it a good idea to transfer them to specialized historical institutes or to regular national archives? And a related question, do these archives collections then fall under specific legislation or under the normal regular national archival laws, which has obviously major implications for many essential questions, such as who gets access to these collections and who regulates this access. So transferring archives to a national archives remains, and I should add, a, a tricky thing in many countries. Uh, in, even in Belgium and in France, uh, access to certain World War II uh, archives remain still very much an ongoing process and a discussion. So this is a series of questions. Is it a good idea to create specific institutes that, that act as sort of gatekeepers that do historical research, memory work, and collect also the, 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 ar the archives, the collections? What are disadvantages and advantages? Um, 
and is full access to uh, to certain information to the general public always advisable? And uh, what is the role of these gatekeepers to collections? That's that's a third point. Fourth key issue, um, very briefly, is the tension between uh, grassroots initiatives on documenting violence and state-sponsored documentation. Very briefly, because I think that the tension is clear to everybody. Uh, ideally, these two levels would work complementary, but this is often not the case. So this is also a point of discussion. How to better align local initiatives, in particular, for example, regarding uh, oral history, for example, or commemorative initiatives that document violence that took place with national archival policies. Fourth, um, fifth, sorry, issue, uh, and I only have one after this, so I'm, I'm concluding. Fifth issue um, relates to the discourse, the political discourse, the, 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 state, the statement uh, that uh, truth, too much truth might kill reconciliation. I think many post-conflict regimes uh, have this period where there is uh, a political discourse that uh, one or other party wants to draw a line between a dictatorial uh, past. Uh, the concrete implication of such, such a statement can often be sealing off archives, closing archives, uh, a lack of support for certain truth or fact-finding uh, research. And the standard political argument for this is obviously that uh, post-conflict societies need to work towards political unity, harmony, social harmony, ultimately reconciliation. Um, and this is a very mobilizing uh, discourse and, and, and an argument that, that holds a lot of power, uh, I think. And I will just give one concrete example of a possible consequence. I don't want to stigmatize any country, but it's just a, an example that I happen to know. The Greek. Uh, government, uh, coalition government at that time in 1988 decided to destroy an estimated uh, 17 million uh, police and surveillance uh, files exactly out of this uh, um, argumentation of preserving uh, social political stability. They incinerated the entire archive so to speak and reserved only the smallest uh, fraction, 2,000 files uh, of some prominent individuals. So the underlying legitimation was uh, that these files would only create persistent division within society, that the only way to move forward towards true reconciliation was to simply destroy the memory of these past conflicts. I think most of the people in this room will disagree with that policy, but nevertheless, I think the point uh, of discussion is clear. Uh, is truth access to information, something that has to be administered in gradual doses? Uh, and if so, what does this imply for state archival policies in relation to the role also of historians and archivists? Lastly, I would like to make a point related to the e-humanities, to the digital turn. I think we, we uh, no session on, on documenting violence uh, could do without uh, this, this component as well. Obviously, digitizing collections, creating digital uh, access to, to, to collections is a, a key way of revolutionizing the way societies implement this right to truth for their citizens. But nevertheless, besides from technical uh, and financial costs, the complexities that this have, there is also a very interesting potential tension between the so-called right to be forgotten versus the right to truth. Um, the European Parliament has pioneered measures towards this so-called right to be uh, forgotten. Uh, this is a right and a discussion that has everything to do, obviously, with uh, the deep digital memory of, uh, of the Internet, uh, the fact that uh, individual uh, citizens have a right to uh, delete information about uh, things that they might have done in the past, uh, also to uh, a right to be untraceable, for example, by certain uh, third parties that would want to, uh, to search for them. So the European Parliament adapted a more limited uh, right to erasure, er erase information uh, in March 2014, but uh, uh, um, the wish for a more broader right to be forgotten remains very much, I think, an ongoing uh, discussion. So a right to be forgotten uh, is, is something that is considered as something that might protect the rights of individual citizens. 
in a digital world. But when, obviously, uh, it creates an interesting discussion, when individual c uh, citizens are able to claim or apply such a right to be forgotten, what would that imply potentially for collective rights to truth? Uh, and what impact would erasing information or destroying certain files, perhaps, who knows, might have on history writing on memory work? These were six points that I just want to, uh, very different, uh, very big issues that I just wanted to throw at the panelists first and foremost. Like I said, we don't have to tackle all of them, uh, but I just wanted to uh, throw them at them to outline uh, the topic in the discussion. Um, so I would now like to give the floor to um, the panelists for an individual statement and an individual reaction to the points and then go to the audience for the plenary discussion. And um, I will uh, give first the floor to uh, Professor um, Ramanava for a first statement. You have the floor. Um. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for the introduction. First, I would like to start with the fact that documents and history are alive when there is interest in studying them. In other ways, they seem to be invisible. I will talk about the experience of working with archives on the territory of former Soviet Union, especially in Belarus. In the 90s brought about a revolution in the study of the Soviet history. This was symbolized by an archival revolution, the declassification of many official documents from the Soviet period, which were made available to historians. One of the achievements of the archival revolution was that any person, not necessarily an expert, was able to study the documents. At the same period, a huge number of publications appeared prepared by archivists in cooperation with academic institutions and universities, but not in Belarus. However, in the former Soviet Union, the access to many different documents are not still available or is limited. Thus, in Belarus, the KGB archive is still absolutely closed for the researchers. At the level of, state, um, of the state policy, the topic of Stalinist repression is still not investigated, and in school textbooks, there is very confusing information. The radical break with the Soviet past did not happen to come true. The historians are to deal with a very limited number of available documents. No a single collection of documents on this topic was published in Belarus. At first, my point is next. To my mind, the term open archive could mean not only complete availability, it's utopia for now, but when the archive works on certain fixed way, it is known when and what is available for the research. When we know not only what is available, but what is unavailable, and why, and when it, it is supposed to become available in future. The experience of the memorial in Moscow shows that researchers can do. They not have to wait when the documents became available, but they sent official requests to the archives to demand open certain documents. For a long time, I have been working on compiling a collection of documents under the working title, The Relationship of Authority and Society, the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic in the Sotis. All documents are from the special sector of the Communist Party. The publication of this collection con cannot be supported by any state Belarusian institutes due to its ideological reasons. So the content of the documents does not correspond to the contemporary historical policy. I would like to emphasize the specific value of the materials as uh, these documents cannot be found today at any other open Belarusian archives funds. For instance, at the fund of Belarusian NKVD, which is completely empty. In the long process of working under the volume, I began using this document for my classes with students. I would like to pay attention to the value of this work. In the age of Googling everything and availability of great number of contradictory sources, 
The key aim of the university's course is to make up the skills of critical thinking. That is to show the historians are not the keeper of any sacral knowledge about the past. There is no objective historical truth, but there are objective historical facts, which can be found in archived documents, for example. Basing on these facts, historians built up their interpretation of the events. It is necessary to pay special attention of the students to the fact that any document itself is very utilitarian. First of all, one should take into account the author and the respondent, the purpose of the document writing. The information is supposed to be mentioned and supposed to be dissembled, the vocabulary used, such as enemies, kulaks, judgments, etc. And what we are able to study through these documents, what we need other kind of sources for, and which one. To show the students that the document always releases some information and always something dissembles. Focusing as examples on famous people and power men create an illusion that the repression influenced lives only at upper society level, which is absolutely wrong. The study of real archives documents about, for example, mass operation gives the students the clear vision of this issue and the answers that what repression, Stalinism, and totalitarianism is. The key imagining issue is the study how and why the repression turned out to be mass and the quantity limits of arrested and shoot it set by Moscow happened to be exceeded in three up to five times. Totalitarianism exists not only by the efforts of the ruling classes, upper levels, with whom people from below have nothing in common. It's um, contributed by all society lawyers. To set the question this way means to touch upon the criminal complicity of so-called small people in the dictatorship, not to let them be only the victims of the regime. One more documents category interesting for study is letter and application to the authorities, a kind of way to digest the facts, why it was me who was arrested, what my fault was, why I incriminated myself and others. Not forget about denunciations, why and what for they were written, and what is known about their authors. At least, but not the last, are the letters of the ex NKVD officers, their appeals to the authority, who explain, who explain their behavior and provided arguments to purge themselves. To sum up, the process of studying archive documents makes students feel himself a discoverer provokes more interest and promotes deeper understanding. My strong belief is that if we succeed to touch our students working with the original historical sources, they will benefit critical way of thinking, not only working with any kind of documents, but reflecting any kinds of information. Uh, we <laughs> We should study history not only from victim's point of view, but from perpetrator's perspective too. And uh, it should be mentioned that one more problem is the term private life of the archives. And I should speak about this. Uh, this term private life, every archive treats its own way. It should be clear enough what does private life means. Intimate relationship, financial side, health conditions, adoption information, something else. And it's relevant only for people who are still alive or not. Any research, as a historian or a journalist working in the archive is legally responsible for slander, professation of the truth. But at present we deal with so-called security system when the archive staff or one archive bureaucrat makes a decision what is good and what is not. My firm belief is that it should be ruled according to the law only. As for the fear of revenge, I would like to quote Nikita Petrov, the memorial activist. We protect the rights of executioners, but why we are not interested in protection of the victims' rights? Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps quickly, before giving the floor to the next uh, speaker, 
thanks for this for this uh, reaction, this, this 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 statement. It was also very nice that you uh, connected a bit to the previous session and and and, and point that I didn't raise uh, actively using uh, archival work uh, within collections by students to actively uh, engage them more in in in, uh, in education. Um, I, w I will quickly go to the next speaker. I would just ask one question. It's, it's a very simple question, um, but as a, as a chair of the session, I preserve, I give myself the right to ask simple uh, questions. In the beginning, you, you, you mentioned, well, open access uh, to, to data and, and archives is, is uh, obviously utopian. I, I don't know if you use the word obviously, but I'm, I, I'm using it now to, to enhance my rhetoric, to, to answer, enhance the question. It's obviously utopian. Huh? You s w why? Why is it utopian? Can you, can you explain that to us? Um, as we know, not historians decide to open a archive or not open a archive. This is the policy of the state. And I think that it's impossible today to enter to the archive and receive everything. Because state will uh, define some kind of documents, files, but uh, it will be very useful for us know what kind of documents we can receive in few letters later, uh, in few years later maybe. And uh, this is the problem that uh, sometimes archives uh, make some kind of documents, um, they uh, open some kind of documents, but, but historians uh, do not nothing about this. And this, I think the, that uh, it will be very useful for historians to know about this decision, about new kind of open sources too. Okay, thank you. I now give the floor to, um, to Dr. Matejka for his reaction or his uh, statement. Good morning, uh, nice for the, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I will give a short overview about the situation in the Czech Republic and I will try to refer to the points raised by Nico Voters. Uh, actually, the bigger picture of the documentation in the Czech Republic is of course a different one than in the post-Soviet countries. Uh, uh, we have a actually well-developed infrastructure of institution with sufficient legal base enabling documenting and researching period of Nazi occupation and also of uh, the time of communist dictatorship. Uh, we have actually, from the perspective of post-communist, uh, of, of post-Soviet countries, we have not really much about uh, <laughs> to complain, uh, but still there are uh, significant gaps in documentation and research, uh, which is somehow surprisingly because uh, we really have the capacities, but still we don't have uh, fully sufficient uh, uh, lists of Czech victims of World War II. Actually, we, we are now trying to um, start to launch a project with German colleagues on documentation on um, on Czech victims of uh, of uh, Nazi judicial uh, judicial apparatus. Um, there are also very big gaps in terms of documentation of uh, state security um, on in terms of structures, perpetrators, and even of victims. So uh, despite we have uh, many capacities, we, haven't, we have many homeworks actually to do. Uh, it results a kind of tensions in Czech society. I very briefly, very simply to tell uh, there's a smaller part of uh, the Czech society which is deeply frustrated in terms that uh, there are these lacks of uh, documentation and the almost completely is missing a kind of a judicial punishment of communist crimes. Um, uh, and also the presence of the communist parties and so on. For this little part of the society, the truth about the history hasn't come, actually. And uh, there are statements like that, that's the reason we are an ill society. It's a big, it's a little but a very active part of society in these terms. Uh, there are many people they are really hurt about uh, missing this, this, uh, this judicial punishment. Uh, for example, the victims, the political prisoners, their organizations. Um, uh, just to, to illustrate this fact, uh, only 39 persons 
has been punished by, uh, by, 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 by uh, trials uh, in the Czech Republic since 1989. Uh, of course, there is no objective measure what is enough or what is uh, which is much or, 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 or not much. But 39 is felt by the most as, as really, really little number. Um, but there is a bigger part of the society, and this uh, really doesn't take care of this issue. The history is for them a kind of a nostalgia, and uh, it serves as a as a, as a instrument how to confirm uh, their unconflicting identity. Uh, Czech Republic is a very, uh, is a country full of history, and the pop culture is very full of, uh, of historical issues. Uh, we have every year many films, many movies related to historical issues, but it doesn't mean necessarily that it serves to a critical reflection on history. Um, coming to the points of uh, Nico Voters, the legal base in Czech Republic is, uh, I think it's very, very good in comparison to, to other countries. It means uh, it, ta it took time, the, 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 the specific laws came a bit later than in other countries, uh, even since 2004 all the files uh, created by uh, state security, uh, military security, uh, and other, other repressive apparatus uh, of communist regimes are available and accessible. Actually, I would say the later it came, the more open it is. Uh, but um, of course, uh, there are some problems and troubles related to that. Um, uh, even on the 11th of January 2017, our constitutional court released a, a good message for us uh, in terms that uh, the archives can be open for, for, for the future. Um, it was the longest decision-making process of our constitutional court. It took uh, two and a half years until the the, our constitutional court came to the decision. and. Uh, the voting ratio was 8 to 7. We have 15 constitutional judges, and it was 8 to 7. So it was really, really close to the closing of, of, of the archives. But So they let the archives open. The, the act enabling the archives open is still in force, which is a good message. But they stress several points. Um, they stress that the conflict, uh, while they were decision, was it was the conflict between uh, the right for the information, the right of, for, the, for the truth, as, as it was uh, formulated by Nico Voters, and the conflict was with the privacy. As our archives are really open, it means that anyone can see anything. There are no limits. You, you don't have to be a historian or a journalist or something like that in order to have an insight into everything. Um, this mean, it means the, the, the lack of of privacy protection. And um, uh, so we are about to rethink our attitude to uh, how to deal publicly with information coming from these archives. It's not only about journalists, they want to have their scandals. It's also about many historians. Uh, uh, for example, we have to explain them that there's a difference between publishing and information coming from uh, state security files in a in a in a book or in a in a uh, in an article in a, in a, in a scientific uh, magazine, and it's a diff it's not the same like publishing these informations on Facebook. So we have to to defer and and to to, to try to cultivate the attitudes of of our uh, historical public. Or uh, yeah. Coming to the institutional base, uh, this was the point. Uh, uh, of Nico Vokers, whether it's good to have a special archive for um, uh, for accessing uh, these these files, um, I think it was at the end the solution of all the countries of all the post-communist countries to building up a special archive. It was also the case of the Czech Republic. Since 2007, we have the uh, state security uh, archive. Uh, I think it's it's necessary to have the special institution, even if it's. Uh, uh, leads to, to tensions because the number of the stuff of our archive is actually the same uh, 
the same like of the National Archive. The State Security Archive has about 160 uh, employees. The National Archive in Prague has also about 150, 160 employees. Uh, but the number of kilometers uh, held in this archive is quite different. Uh, the State Security Archive has 20 kilometers of um, files, and um, the National Archive has about 200, more than 200 kilometers. That means. Uh, uh, but this stuff is needed for making this really accessible. Um, the, the number of demands of requests coming into the archive is very high, and uh, so the stuff is needed. But of course, in the rest of the of the archival public, it's not seen really uh, with with uh, with sympathy, of course. Uh, but I think, on the other hand, it wouldn't work if you would try to, to do, uh, if you put this archive together, I, don't, I wouldn't say that, that uh, the accessibility would be, uh, would be the same. Uh, coming to the institutions, of course, for the documentation, other institutions are, are needed. The very first one was the Institute for the, uh, of the Contemporary History uh, and the Czech Academy of Science. Uh, it was founded 1990. I think it's, it's very good for the Czech Republic that we have this uh, institute since <laughs> more than seven, uh, 27 years, because it's so, it has his tradition, so nobody puts it into question. And um, uh, it has his scientific relevance, of course. And um, uh, this institute had a scientific identity from the very beginning. Uh, which wasn't the case of our institute, which was based on, uh, uh, founded uh, uh, 10 years ago, actually. Um, it was uh, based as a some, something between a uh, memory institution, a commemorational institution, and a research institution. And uh, in fact, it led to a, 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 a kind of uncertainty about the identity if, of the institute, which of course was often politically disused and misled. So our attempt is since several years to make the institution defi by definition a research institute, a scientific one, and of course with a strong education, but uh, in try to come a bit farther from the politics, which is sometimes not, not that easy. And, um, but we hope it, we will succeed somehow. Your point, coming to your point of oral history. Oral history is a big issue in the Czech Republic. I think since several years, there was a kind of a oral history turn, a uh, big interest on oral history. And then there's also a bit tension between uh, the scientific approach to the oral history and the activistic approach to the oral history. There are big projects. There's a, a oral history association which uh, would represent the scientific approach, and then, for example, the Memory of Nation is a big project which would approach, which would represent more the activist approach. Uh, this Memory of Nation project is is a beautiful. It was, it was uh, represented yesterday. It has more than 4,000 uh, witness, witnesses of time, um, uh, but. Uh, uh, sometimes the presentation is very emotional, is, is concentrated on heroes, on, on kind of heroes, and the, the picture of the history is done, not really completed then. And um, uh, so there's, there are kind of tangents. To come to, the, to my conclusion, um, what, what is to, uh, our work in Czech Republic in terms of documentation of violence about is first patient filling gaps uh, we have we have these homeworks. It's it's not really it's time consuming from the perspective of institutions like we are. It's really time consuming. It's very expensive. It's not really sexy because you are working on for seven eight years on a on a documentary and then there's a big book out of it and no, nobody is really excited about it. But but it's needed and uh, we 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 we, we, we take to our commitment to, to work on that. And um, but this mo maybe more important is that we try to find ways how to com cultivate a commemoration and especially the public debate on controversial issues related to modern history. In general, when I make it simple, it's about to less activism in terms uh, in terms of running campaigns against specific pe persons or in, st in stimulating emotions concerning to to the modern history, I think it, it's, it doesn't work really well in, in 
Czech political context, we need more like something like a historical literacy in terms of citizenship education. That means the history and the modern history and dealing with the modern history is a part of ver raising awareness of our democracy and of our uh, democratic political systems. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You raised several questions. I won't ask any questions because I want to leave enough uh, time for the, for the audience, so I will immediately uh, go to our last uh, speaker of, of uh, the panel, Professor Kaminski, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, before I come to some remarks about the German example, I would uh, share some thoughts I had about the uh, uh, dealing with documentation of state violence and some remarks Nico um, did. Normally, when we speak about documenting state violence, we speak about post-faction or about reconstruction of facts and reconstruction of a violent past because it's a, it's a total um, uh, single case that violence is documented while it is going on. Normally, uh, only the offenders know that they are uh, committing crimes. Because even, even in the Third Reich, in the uh, German uh, Nazi time, um, it, wa it was not published that they will go to kill the Jews. And um, when information about state violence get published or will be known while it's going on, then you can see in the case of the Third Reich um, that it is not believed. Uh, the reports about Auschwitz were known, but nobody really believed that this is possible. Um, the massacre of Katyn was known, but it was not believed that the Soviet troops would kill uh, the Polish um, military and civil allies. Or we come to, a, uh, to, a, to an example from recent times, Cambodia. There was a genocide from tremendous uh, dimensions, but uh, even the, the international delegations from Red Cross and other uh, institutions or from <coughs> Sweden um, going to Cambodia, they came back and said, <coughs> we didn't see any, any person tortured or killed. We didn't see the killing fields. So I think first we have to face the problems that we, that we made post-documentation. Because even, uh, um, and this is also a problem we, we had in Germany, that normally the offenders and the responsibles for, for criminal acts, they don't write down, we will go to kill these or that people. And I think the only exception was Stalin, who uh, added to his death lists um, um, new, new people or increased the number of people who had to be killed. So how to, then how to, how to prove decades later uh, that these crimes were committed and this was state violence which happened. Um, we have on one hand side the opening of the, of the documents and the files. Um, on the other hand, we have the securing of the crime scenes and uh, realizing memor memorial places. We have the witness reports, and this is a really interesting point for me because uh, often the witness reports are not trusted. They are not believed, and we, we can find that uh, in the panel uh, in the penal prosecutions, in the legal prosecutions, um, when uh, eyewitnesses or witnesses or survivors have to appear at the court, they, they often are treated like liars. And uh, they are asked to prove that what they tell about their own experience is really true. And they will ask to, to name their offenders, to um, to, to, um, to identify exact dates, and if they are not able to say it was the 28th of April when the, this happened, then uh, the conclusion is it is not right. Um, this is also due to the lack of information we have normally. And um, 
um, my 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 uh, other point in this is um, if we speak about violence, uh, it is often reduced to the violence to victims or victims groups, but in totalitarian states, in totalitarian or dictatorial regimes, violence is a kind of kit with puts together society and state, and it is also the violence that the offenders has to stand. Because we know that from Stalinist Soviet Union, but we know that from all other communist countries, that even the party leaders feared their life long that they also could be arrested and shot or I don't know what. So um, violence, uh, uh, the, the, the whole population is addressed by violence. And my last point in this is um, we have to face a change in the concept of violence and the concept of um, of dealing with uh, oral and written reports by, by, by witnesses. And the witnesses can be, uh, Nico said this, the offenders and the victims and the bystanders and onlookers as well. Because uh, in criminal reports, we know that, um, it is often asked, maybe you have seen something, you don't know that you have seen that, or you don't know that it means something. And our concept of violence changed. Um, uh, it, is, it is more ex respected and accepted that violence against the individual is not allowed. Even the so-called soft uh, forms of violence, psychological violence, and we in Germany, we had uh, uh, this um, invention from the Stasi, the uh, dissolution of personality, Zersetzung is a German word, uh, which means that you don't need to kill a person. It, it is enough to destroy its private, familiar, and personal surrounding to destroy a, a, a man or a woman. Yeah, maybe, that, and if there are some questions about German example, I can, I can add. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much uh, to Kaminsky and also to the three panelists for um, giving their specific statement and also reacting to some of the uh, issues uh, raised. I think um, it, they all exemplify that we're dealing with a large and a complex uh, topic very much. Also, uh, this is obviously very, very much a legal session. I mean, we're talking about uh, conflicting uh, international and national legislation and different rights that are often conflicting. But we are also dealing with, with collective memory and, and how, to, how to document post-factum uh, violence and what impact that, that has on the way we will later then use this information to construct history, uh, to write history, et, et cetera. So it's potentially very uh, large, which is a good thing because that will, uh, I assume, uh, leave many uh, room for different uh, Questions, we have approximately 20, 20 to 25 minutes for questions. Um, so I would, without further ado, like to give the floor to the audience for questions. Sir, and if there are any questions. Very briefly questions. about our experience in, in, in Serbia. Uh, after the, the collapse of Yugoslavia, all the, uh, the, the uh, secret uh, security archives were uh, in fact usurped by Serbia. Uh, these uh, services, uh, having been highly uh, uh, centralized, uh, one of the first things Milosevic did when he uh, uh, came into power was to seize the uh, federal security police uh, archives. So this whole thing, uh, and, uh, but they have never, never been opened. They are now uh, in, in possession of the uh, Serbian secret uh, police and the Serbian army. That means that the goat is uh, guarding the, uh, the cabbage field, in fact. It has uh, also a very uh, important dimension which, which, is, which has been neglected, and that, that's the international dimension. <clears throat> These uh, archives uh, contain files on uh, uh, people, uh, suspicious people, uh, 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 who are now citizens of other countries uh, that emerged from the uh, collapse of Yugoslavia. That means the five remaining uh, uh, 
uh, uh, federated republics, Croatia, Slovenia, Macedonia, Bosnia, Kosovo, Montenegro. So these, these people who are, whose, whose uh, files are in the possession of, 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 of the Serbian secret police are in fact hostages of, of, of the Serbian secret services which have never been in, uh, reformed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another, other questions or remarks uh, to one of the panelists or all of the panelists? Thank you, Nico, and uh, other contributors for um, your talk. I think um, I really like the six points that you mentioned, but I think um, we can also connect a couple of those points. And especially I'm thinking about the last one. You're drawing out an interesting um, tension about digitization uh, and the huge development and the proliferation of database and heritage infrastructures these days in, in Europe. And um, I think we could also connect that to your second point, the problem of sequencing and ordering. Um, there is a trend in these digital heritage infrastructures, memory infrastructures, that we tend to forget how they're built. And Bruno Latour used the word black boxing um, to see all these technical and digital infrastructures as, as some kind of an objective environment where we can access the truth, but in the end there are cultural, political constructs where data is ordered, where data is made available to certain people in certain ways. So I think there's also definitely more room um, for theoretization uh, and reflexivity on um, the huge digital turn in the humanities that will surely impact um, these, um, the utilization of these infrastructures in the future. Okay, thank you. Yes, you took one of the points, indeed, a step further to the further implications it might have, reflection on, on uh, digital. Yeah, of course, uh, if, if one of the panelists obviously wants to respond or all of I, I wanted just briefly to respond with uh, short experience from Czech Republic. Uh, I, I don't want to neglect uh, what your, your belief into the big future of digitalization, but uh, we have now in uh, uh, behind us a, a actually a sad experience with how bad can be the digitalization dealt actually. There was a, uh, a it, I would call it a kind of a quantitative approach that means it was digitalized uh, and the only critis, the only criteria was the was the mass of, of scans you have. And then um, uh, we have for several years ago in our archive of state security archive, we have to start a kind of reform of rethinking the digitalization, even in terms of uh, um, getting the scans also in uh, having them uh, in good quality, which is not, uh, which, which is then uh, quite expensive to make it really good, the dig digitalization, and it's not that easy to, to make it really good. And But another point is to, to work with metadata. And I sh our experience is that no Czech archive is really capable to, to uh, set reasonable metadata to the digitalized copies in order to build then the digital collections in the way the digital humanities um, foresee that actually. So uh, for me, I, 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 I like this, 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 this future vision, but uh, the Czech experience is that uh, it's not really that easy to, to become to that. And we are not the beginners. We, last year we have started the, the first online access to, to our archive. Of course, it's not uh, easy online. It's after uh, uh, registration, personal registration. But then we have now about 5 million scans online with good uh, search machine and, and really uh, good uh, finding aids. Uh, but uh, I think it's still far from having really this uh, nice digital collection, these virtual archives uh, uh, make out of, uh, of digitalized uh, copies. Yeah. Okay, thank you for uh, adding that. I think it's a very hands-on uh, reaction also to, to um, the, the, the many problems or issues with uh, digitization programs. I think uh, the, the point was also more a call uh, to, if I interpret it correctly, it's for a more um, 
for more reflection on, on the fact that these virtual research environments or whatever you want to call it uh, are constructs uh, and, and are very much the result. It's not objectively, let's say, putting out information for, for everybody to use in some, some utopian democratic uh, knowledge uh, society, so to speak, but it, it's very much also a process of funding, of making uh, decisions on, on what, uh, what and how to present certain things. So I think that was, to put it simplistically or simple a bit, the, the, the question also. And I think we do need more reflection on, on, uh, on this because obviously this is very much the future and we will all be confronted with, with uh, this ongoing digital revolution. Huh? So, okay, other uh, questions there and, and here also a question. All right, I do have a question, but I also have a few follow-up um, remarks to the six points you made. Um, I represent the, one of the larger collections in the context of Eastern European Secret Police Archives, the uh, Federal Commissioner in Germany for the Stasi Archives. So um, I think in terms of um, uh, the political discourse of whether you should allow access right away or you should gradually have access to records that might, you know, you kill, you, you can overkill with the truth. I do not agree with that at all. It's sort of anti, um, you know, the German word is Aufklärung, but you, you really want to know in who's deciding what you can access and what not. Um, you, can't, you can't find a mechanism to tell people you can only access this part and next year you will be able to get 50% of the truth and then in five years it's going to be 75. There's no way to do that and truth can set you free, it can hurt, it can create more conflict. But, and that's a very specific case, but with all the Eastern European archives together, um, full access has not led to vengeance or complications. It has actually benefited the victims, it gave them a voice, it, it created a discourse. The Germans were the first to start, was the easiest template because the country that um, had held the communist regime uh, records disappeared. So for 27 years we've had that discussion and uh, it worked pretty well. So I, I think that, that, in my mind, can be resolved easily, that uh, you can't gradually access it's, it's all or nothing if you have an archive. Um, I think that um, in terms of the right to be forgotten, and that exists regardless of digitization of the documents, uh, the right to truth supersedes in historic context the rights to be forgotten, but there may have to be extra special care in, in what you to, you put online. The Czech Republic is an example of full access to all kinds of information. I think the Guatemalan case is the same. There was no state actor that could be trusted to guard the information of the victims, so everything was put it was made available and accessible, that creates its own conflicts. The Germans are particularly strict in going through each and every single record and anonymize third party or victims information if you not have the right to access that. That's a very tedious and time consuming um, effort. So what we put online is curated content and historical content and sort of documents that only document activities of the Stasi itself. And the, the question leads to the, the third point uh, you made, number four. Um, I think digitization allows for a better collaboration of state and non-state actors and agents in this process. You know, so you have an easier um, access to all kinds of sources. And I wanted to know of all three of you how much you value as state actors collaboration with, with, with civic groups and, and non-state actors and how you can better build collaborative resources of, of um, addressing you know, undocumented um, injustice, injustice of the past. Yeah. Um, I would like to, act, uh, to add uh, uh, one experience from the, from the German example when in the 90s uh, the, the, the huge and controversial debate started if the former Stasi files should be opened or not. Um, there was not a difference between East and West, mostly, but it was uh, even East German activists which said, no, this file should be burned. Because all what is inside the files is um, is so sick and is mad and um, what's the word for schmutz? Yeah, it's dirty. 
It's dirty because um, uh, for the future generations or for people who are looking in these files, we can't explain who, uh, who made these files with what purpose that it was not, uh, uh, these files were not made for giving, for giving a right uh, image of a person. It was made ma mostly for collecting um, charging facts. Uh, but in some way, there are very useful information in it, and uh, at least it was feared um, that there would be a lot of revenge acts against the, uh, the former collaborators with the secret police and the secret police uh, um, of, of officials. But nothing happened like that in Germany. Uh, um, people uh, read their documents and often tried to get in dialogue with the offenders and with the people uh, reporting about them. Um, this, is, uh, um, this is one experience and uh, on behalf of the of the cooperation between um, NGOs and uh, state-funded or financed institutions, um, Germany is often regarded as a role model for good practice of transitional justice. And maybe we are compared with other with other countries. And and I'm very happy to live in Germany and to have all these resources we have. Um, no complaint about it. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, um, this, uh, um, um, we, are, we, we have also a tendency to, um, to, uh, to let it, or uh, to let it, re to, to let it uh, um, uh, uh, directed by state institutions. Uh, and I think the culture of NGOs is much, uh, much more progressive in other countries. I, I won't judge about if what is better, but at the end we have in Germany in the last 25 years the processes more and more NGO funded initiatives are overtaken by the state for good or bad. This have to judge future generations, not we, but um, state, German state is overtaking a lot of responsibility. Perhaps uh, then we take another question. Perhaps also react to the, 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 the say civic society versus state-sponsored the, 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 uh, symbiosis the synergies. Yes. Okay, uh, of course. Um, I think it's definitely necessary to have a kind of dialogue between uh, between NGO initiatives and state sector. Um, I think by definition uh, the, the modern history, the the, the, the latest history can be dealt in public space only in kind of dialogue because uh, in terms of dialogue because there's it's very hard to to make uh, a conflicting issue out of uh, of the of the present history of the latest history it's dangerous for sustainability for the for the complexity of the society and um, that's why a dialogue is needed on all levels uh, of course we we try to do that in my position is, is uh, uh, in, in the institute. We, we try, of course, we have dozens of partners and something like that. We have a different situation than in Germany, in, in Czech Republic. Many, many, uh, many issues was dealt first by NGO sector and then secondly, somehow over was the, it, it was overtaken by state, mostly. It was the, the initiative come, comes very often from the grassroots. Uh, but still there is a dangerous uh, uh, i i've tried to tell in my first uh, in my first speech here that um, uh, i think to some extent the activism is is not really good for uh, for for dealing with the latest history in public space i think this this trying to raise the emotions and trying to um, to to uh, le it, it leads actually to uh, that, that to that, that uh, to the problem that uh, 
that the latest history is a part of, of these political struggles, of these political campaigns, uh, which is not really the way how uh, we could learn out of the history something really reasonable for, for us, how to understand the history, how to understand the dictatorship and so on. So uh, many initiatives, many, uh, many activists are dealing this way, so we are trying to to, to, to play a more moderating role, kind of, if it's possible, uh, and not only a, a partner for, for some items, for some specific actions. Okay, thank you. I will let you react uh, also to the issue of uh, civic society, state-sponsored or grassroots state-sponsored. Um, about grassroots in initiative in our country, it's very difficult to say something, but we have... Um, uh, some oral history projects which was introduced tomorrow and um, uh, it was a um, huge movement which was connected with uh, our famous place which connected with the repression, with the mass repression, Kurapati. It was the movement to defend Kurapati from the authority and now this is a point for authority to think about this place as a um, memorial on the state level. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for these three reactions. There was another question. Yes, there. Dziwanowski uh, Stefańczyk from ENRS. I have a question to Dr. Matejka. Um, in Poland, as well as in Germany, the, the files are accessible, but it's regulated. Um, for the reasons listed by Dr. Kaminski, that these are dirty files, that uh, using them uh, needs a special historical critique. And therefore, I have a question to you. Do you not only make it access fully accessible, but do you also teach how to use it? Is there a special program for people who want to use them? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we think we should do that. Uh, we tried, but, but the ways how to do that, there are not many ways how to do that. Uh, we try to somehow to, to write articles about that. We, we try to deal with our historians. That uh, There were cases where historians from our institute were involved in campaigns, uh, which we definitely think it's not, uh, it's, it's not, pub it's not possible. We try to, to explain, but um, we are now preparing a, a book about that, about the cases of... Uh, um, how to deal with uh, with uh, information from state security archives, but um, you know, um, but as, as, as ni sorry? sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry to interrupt, but just on a very basic uh, level, for example, again, a simple simple question, but if somebody asks a file related to to relatives, to father, grandfather, mm. to family, whatever access. Um, what what happens then? Is is, he, what, is, is there? Does he, he just? Get yep. the files. He just arrives at nine o'clock, and he yep. just, or or is there yep. some some kind of an uh, I don't know um, unschooling? No, no, yeah. The, uh, what happens then? No, no, no. If you if you send the request to to our, to our archive, you will get it. Of course, there is a paragraph. There are some exceptions, but they, they, they are, they, this, this is very little. The person is not accessible. So you will get the the, the files concerning your family. Actually, you will, by our archivists are not capable to tell you anything about it because they don't know what is in your file. So um, there's no level of screening or no. It's no, 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 no. Just, just over handing over to to the people. They get it, and then it's 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 hard sometimes. We have. Uh, uh, this was the debate in our constitutional court because there are not that much uh, public affairs or public uh, public uh, pub uh, media scandals concerning state security anymore. There are not much anymore. We have one with one of the powerful politicians at the moment, but uh, um, not that much any, uh, uh, at all in the media, but in, in private sphere. We know about many cases where the people are misusing, from our perspective, misusing the information in divorcing uh, for, for, uh, trials or in, in, in personal struggles and, and so on. So uh, definitely it's not the way the archives should be used, but um, there's no way how to, uh, how to stop it. 
we just try to to to, to educate the people, but it, we have very little possibilities. We hope that in the years the archives are accessible, the people have somehow learned how to deal with it. But it's uh, as I follow the, uh, a, a little bit the, the, the debates in Germany. Uh, I think the Germans are much better in that, and we are far from from the level of Germany. And uh, yeah, we will will take some time. We have to actually. <laughs> no, no, of course, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah um, as you surely know, um, uh, Germany uh, accorded uh, beginning from the 3rd of, of October 1990 to open all files. Not only the files of the secret police, which were open for the victims and the public and research, but all files from from state from from communist state in the GDR. Mm -hmm. But most interest and and I think it was it is understandable. Most interest got the opening of the Stasi files and Dagmar Höberstedt is here. She can speak more about that. Um, but the interesting result or consequence of the opening of the secret po po police files was that the other files. Uh, lost in uh, uh, loss, uh, yeah, uh, uh, lived a loss of importance because uh, there, there was such a concentration of what the secret police collected and what they reported and what they not reported and, and a lot of people asking for their files were very disappointed when they got the answer that there are no files about them. Um, um, but 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 for me this is also related to the violence and to the soft forms of violence. A communist dictatorship was able to create a climate that everybody felt uh, uh, watched and controlled, and and even that there are no files about them. Um, th this was that what what, what led worked and 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 uh, 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 functioned communist dictatorship. But another uh, consequence we had in Germany is that it was forgotten that it was a communist dictatorship and it appeared more and more to be the dictatorship of the secret police, of the Stasi. And since more or less 10 or 15 years, a lot of institutions, uh, the Stasi Unterlagen uh, or institution, we as foundation, um, we are trying uh, to put it to, uh, like Hegel would say, we put it from from the from the head uh, from the head to the feet again to say who was responsible and who has the power in the state and and which institution was the instrument. And if you are in this year, we we, we are in 2017, we uh, we are remembering and researching 100 years of communist power in the world. Um, and in Germany, we have a very interesting. Um, development in, in, in from 1990 on, you can see that on our name, the name of our foundation, Foundation for Dealing with the Past of the SED Dictatorship. In Czech or in Poland, I can't imagine that there would be the research about the dictatorship uh, from the KPG or PVP or how the communist parties was called. It is natural to speak about the communist dictatorship. And my uh, suspicion is, or my, my thinking is, that in 1990, uh, to speak or to reduce the communist dictatorship in Eastern Germany to the SED dictatorship was the smallest consens and compromise which could be found in between Western and Eastern activists at that time. Thank you for this uh, uh, reaction. Um, my program tells me that we're, um, we should have lunch right now. So um, I think um, I will leave it at, uh, at this. I, I think the discussion was kind of testimony to what I said in the beginning, that this is uh, a very transversal session with a lot of uh, 
a lot of ties to very different uh, debates, but um, I think it's, it's a very fruitful debate if we, I mean, we don't have to solve everything, obviously, or anything even. Um, but I think it's a very good thing that we uh, touched on a lot of uh, key issues uh, of, this, uh, of this issue of documenting violence. So I thank uh, certainly the panelists for their, uh, for their statements, their reactions. I thank you for your attention and I invite you on behalf of the organizers to lunch, I hope. Yeah. Uh, just, just if you could stay just uh, one minute, there's important things that I need to say before.